Okay, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our press conference. I'm Becca Dezombek from AGU's Media Relations Office. Uh, the press conference that we will be starting right now is uh, on the major discoveries as NASA's Parker Solar Probe closes in on the sun. We will begin with each of the panelists giving brief presentations describing their work, and then we'll open it up to questions from reporters. And we will end this press conference on the hour or when there are no more questions, whichever comes first. On-site reporters will be able to meet with on-site panelists in the quiet room in room R05, which is next to the press room on the second floor, following the press event. Reporters, because this is a Zoom webinar, you won't be able to uh, turn on your video or microphone. So if you would like to ask a question, please type your full name and affiliation into the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box. Uh, and my colleague Liza um, will request that you um, unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, alternatively, if you would like to just ask your question via text, you can type your name, affiliation, and your complete question in the box and one of us will pose it to the panel uh, on your behalf. And we will address the questions in the orders that, uh, that they were received. Uh, please, um, you can write in your question at any time during this presentation, but note that we won't actually uh, ask any questions until the panelists have finished their presentations and we are actually in the Q&A uh, portion of this press conference. Um, please also make sure that your Zoom name is accurate uh, so that we can quickly find you in the participant list and unmute you so that you can ask your question. Uh, slides and any additional materials from the press conference will be posted to the Press Information Exchange in AGU Connect, and we will drop a link to that in the chat. Um, it's also being recorded and the recording will be posted on YouTube and the link will be shared to that uh, in the Press Information Exchange as well. Please bear with us should any technical issues arise. Uh, if Zoom webinar does go down for any reason, we will switch um, to presenting this press conference through a teleconference line. And if that does happen, we will immediately send out an email to all panelists and attendees with instructions on how to gain access to that teleconference line. Otherwise, if you experience any technical issues during this press uh, conference, please email news at agu.org. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our panelists uh, to tell us about their work. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. And thank you so much for coming to the Parker Solar Pro Press Conference. Uh, I think we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, my name is Nikki Fox, and I am the uh, Heliophysics Division Director at the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. Um, if we go to the next chart, thank you so much. Um, I could not be more thrilled to be here today to share with you some really exciting news about the Parker Solar Probe mission. As I'm sure you know, we launched Parker Solar Probe in 2018 to explore the mysteries of the sun by literally traveling right through the region of space where all of the action happens. In other words, traveling for the very first time through the atmosphere of our star. This atmosphere, or the corona, is that wispy atmosphere that I'm really hoping many of you were able to see in the spectacular images from last week's total solar eclipse in Antarctica. And literally for centuries, humanity has only been able to observe this atmosphere from afar. So if we could go to the next slide, and I'm gonna ask you to imagine yourself kind of sitting on a beach and staring at the ocean, wondering what lies beneath the surface. And this is basically what scientists have been doing for decades, wondering what mysteries lie in the sun's corona. Now, just three years after launch, um, although decades after scientists first dreamt about this mission, we have finally arrived. Humanity has touched the sun. Parker Solar Probe has allowed us to dive beneath the surface to experience for the first time the atmosphere of a star. In previous orbits, we've been almost just surfing along this boundary, but after a recent Venus flyby, the orbit now takes Parker Solar Probe closer to the sun and on a path beneath the boundary. Speaking more scientifically, this means Parker Solar Probe has crossed the critical boundary between the supersonic solar wind and the constrained corona. Not only that, but the spacecraft has flown multiple times in and out, crossing this boundary, going in and out of the solar corona over the last orbits. So through the very region where the solar wind gets heated and accelerated. 
This is a great achievement and one of the biggest milestones for Parker Solar Probe as we enter a new critical phase of the mission. Just as landing on the moon allowed scientists to understand how it was formed, touching the sun is a gigantic stride for humanity to help us uncover critical information about our closest star. Also, its influence on our solar system, and most importantly, how we can live in harmony with it. This amazing feat occurred first on April 28th of this year during its eighth flyby of the sun. This milestone is a first for any spacecraft and marks one major step for Parker Solar Probe and one giant leap for solar science. And now it is my pleasure to pass you on to Noor, who's gonna show us some images from WISPA. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, hello, <clears throat> I'm Noor Rawafi, the project scientist of, uh, for the Parker Solar Probe mission. What an outstanding achievement by the Parker mission to fly through the harshest environment and to tell us how the solar corona works. We awaited this moment for decades. We know the solar wind is born in the solar corona and as well as the hazardous radiation caused by uh, uh, solar ex explosive events. But we don't know how that happens and we don't know the physical processes behind that. We have observed the solar corona for, uh, if we go to the next slide, please. We have observed the solar corona for decades from afar like Earth. The problem is that the fingerprints of the physical processes giving rise to the solar wind are erased by the journey from the solar corona to Earth and beyond. And that is the very reason we have Parker Solar Probe flying through this mysterious region to tell us what is going on there. Our voyage is revealing a range of surprises as we venture into new places. The new physics we are learning about the immediate envi solar environment and the young solar wind is mind boggling. Parker Solar Probe is redefining the landscape for solar and heliophysics research. We are learning more about the environment in the inner heliosphere. Most not notably, it is some, somewhat dustier than we thought. This presents us with fascinating scientific op opportunities, but also some real challenges. The good news is that our engineers at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and our partners, uh, partner institution designed the spacecraft to withstand environments just like this. And Parker Solar Probe is healthy and performing is amazingly. And that, that is just looking at the, the amount of data we are, that, is, that Parker is returning us. We are returning um, way, way more data than we ever dreamed of. Next slide, please. When Parker uh, crossed the, uh, the boundaries between the, the boundary between the solar wind and the solar corona, the spacecraft encountered the specific uh, uh, conditions, that is, uh, specific magnetic fields and particle conditions to tell us we are in a new regime of the solar wind. We are in a new region of the solar wind. We have, we have confirmed that with uh, different measurements, that is, magnetic fields, particles, and images. Getting closer to one of the primary, getting closer to the sun, one of the primary goals of the Parker mission is to fly within the solar corona, that is, within structures that we see during total solar eclipses. Parker is doing that precisely uh, for the last few, few encounters. It will, it will continue doing that for the rest of the mission. This set of images uh, you are looking at here are from the only imager, uh, Whisper, that is on the spacecraft. One thing is eye-catching. If you look at structures on the upper part of the field of view and the lower, uh, the, uh, on the lower part of it, in the upper part the structure, they are moving uh, higher and higher as we, as we move from left to right. And the lower part of the field of view, if you look at the lower row, you would see structures moving down, down and down and down until the exit of the field of view. Now, imagine that you are riding on Parker Solar Pro. When you are looking at the structure from afar, they will basically look at you in the same location in space. But when you are flying through them, some of them, they will be passing above your head. Others will be uh, flying be, be below your feet. And that is exactly what Parker Solar Probe is observing. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, Parker Solar Probe is gliding through the solar corona. And this is, this is a fascinating, fascinating uh, times we are living here with, with the mission. Next slide, please. Okay, this is this is the whole movie from Encounter Nine, as Parker Solar Probe flew by the sun, 
And obviously, uh, we, you can see in the middle of the movie what I described before when Parker is flying through the corona, and you see it now. But there are a myriad of structures that, we, that Parker Slope observed that we couldn't see from afar. We've seen uh, coronal mass, core mass ejections, um, small uh, coronal mass ejections. We've seen flux ropes. We've seen fronts. We've seen blobs. And that is fascinating. We could not see all the details from, from afar like Earth. And the thing is that we have, now we have to make sense of all of that. Um, so crossing from the solar wind to the solar corona, we also confirmed it through other measurements from sweeping fields. We not only crossed the critical boundaries between the solar wind and the corona, but now we also see signatures of the processes that are giving rise to the solar wind in the first place, that, are, that is the base of the corona, Parker Solar Probe is telling us. We have been wondering about this for six decades now, but now we are there. And this is what Justin and Stewart will, will show in a minute. Now, as we advance, Parker Solar Probe will provide more of this invaluable data to understand the genesis of the solar wind, how it is heated and accelerated. Ladies and gentlemen, we are flying through the source of the solar wind, and it is fascinatingly exciting. With that, I'll pass it to Justin to explain further how we knew we entered the solar corona. Justin, take it away, please. Thank you, Noor. Hello, my name is Justin Casper, and I'm the principal investigator for the solar wind electrons, alphas, and protons investigation on Parker Solar Probe, also known as the sweep investigation. Next slide, please. So what, what does this all mean? Well, I'm really thrilled to say that we've officially touched the sun. Now, what do I mean when I say that? Unlike Earth, the sun doesn't have a solid surface. Our star does have an atmosphere known as the corona. The corona is made of solar material bound to the sun by gravity and by magnetic forces. As that material gets pushed away from the sun by activity on the sun's surface, it reaches a point where the gravitational forces and the magnetic fields are too weak to contain it. That point is called the Alfane critical surface. It marks the interface between the solar corona and the solar wind. Parker Solar Probe crossed below the Alfane critical surface for the first time on April 28, 2021, during its eighth flyby of the sun at a distance of under 20 solar radii, or roughly eight and a half million miles from the center of the sun. By crossing the Alfane critical surface at that point, Parker Solar Probe passed from the solar wind into our sun's atmosphere. Based on Parker's observations of the uh, Alphane critical surface, the surface is wrinkled and the spacecraft passed above and below the surface three separate times during the encounter. Next slide, please. Now, what we saw when we crossed the Alphane critical surface and entered the corona was that the conditions changed completely. Inside the corona, the sun's magnetic field grows much stronger. Oh, can we go on to the uh, next slide? I think we... Uh, Thank you. When you cross uh, the Alphane critical surface near the corona, we saw the conditions change completely. Inside the corona, the sun's magnetic field grew much stronger, and it dominated the movement of the particles there. Instead of waves just gushing out from the sun, which is what we normally see in the solar wind, waves that were moving back and forth. In fact, below the Alphane critical point, waves could make it all the way back to the very surface of the sun. So the spacecraft was surrounded by material that was truly in contact with the sun and the atmosphere of the sun. This is really important because the strong magnetic fields and the mixture of waves that are happening there can supercharge the heating of the solar corona. We'll now be able to witness directly how coronal heating happens. Next slide, please. In this region, we also found another surprising thing. As it happened, the first time we passed below the Alphane critical surface, we were flying through what ended up being the tip of a pseudo streamer, a huge structure that straddles more than 40 degrees across at its base back on the surface of the sun. Pseudo streamers can also be seen in eclipse photos uh, where you see these dense structures that stretch far away from the sun. Flying through this region was like flying through the eye of a storm. The conditions quieted, the density of the atmosphere dropped significantly, and the sun's magnetic field was stronger. We don't know why a pseudo streamer would cause a wrinkle in the Alphane surface. Next slide. Now there's several reasons why it's important to be taking direct measurements inside the Alphane critical surface. First, 
The magnetic field in the corona is so strong, it actually slows down the rate at which the sun spins. And the magnitude of the spin down is determined by the distance of the alphane critical surface from the sun. Now that we know the location of the surface, this will allow us to determine how solar activity changes over long time scales as the sun ages and slows down. Understanding the evolution of our sun not only teaches us about our own solar system, but also is key to understanding whether life can flourish in other stellar systems. Secondly, this region is also where coronal heating happens, which is a key mystery about our sun. The sun's surface at around 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the temperature jumps to millions of degrees Fahrenheit when you're in the solar atmosphere and head into the corona. We can finally see directly how this heating is happening in the solar atmosphere. Thirdly, being in the corona allows us to finally pinpoint where the solar wind is coming from and figure out the origins of different types of solar wind. Solar wind shapes our entire solar system as a critical factor in space weather that can affect our technology in space and here on Earth. Next slide, please. Now looking forward, Parker was at about 20 solar radii when it crossed into the corona for the first time, and will eventually dip down about twice as close to about nine solar radii in 2025, as illustrated in this uh, graphic here. Being this close to the sun is allowing us to make really an interesting and new connections we couldn't be able to do from afar. And for one example of such a discovery, I'm gonna pass this along to Stuart. Okay, thanks, Justin. Um, hi, my name is Stuart Bale. And I'm the NASA principal investigator for the FIELDS experiment on Parker Solar Probe. Uh, one of the most interesting things about flying so close to the sun is that we're seeing things now that, we, that we've never seen before, things that we actually couldn't have seen before um, from, from near Earth. The thing that we're seeing now in detail is that there are spatially separated discrete sources of solar wind uh, with different plasma properties, kind of sub, substructure. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there we go. So a little background. Um, uh, since the mid-1990s, we've known that about these uh, kind of bizarre S-shaped kinks in the solar wind's magnetic field. We call them, uh, we call them switchbacks. Uh, and they, <clears throat> they kind of act as a detour for the charged particles uh, as they, on a zigzag path as they, as they escape from the sun. They were first discovered um, a long time ago by the NASA European Space Agency mission called Ulysses. Uh, and, and they were long just thought to be kind of a curiosity in the solar wind. Next slide. But in, let's go, there we go. But in 2019, uh, at 35 solar radii from the sun, Parker Solar Probe discovered that these switchbacks actually aren't that rare. They're, they're actually very common, uh, ubiquitous even uh, at these altitudes. Um, the renewed interest in, this, in these features raised a question, where are they coming from? Are they, are they forged down at the surface of the sun? Or are they shaped by some process that, that kinks the magnetic field as the solar wind expands away from the sun? We don't know yet, but, but we're honing in on some things. Um, we suspect that, the, that learning more about these switchbacks will actually help us answer uh, two of Parker Solar Probe's highest science objective, highest level science objectives. Where does the solar wind originate and how is it heated? Next slide, please. So now, three years after launch, we know where at least one source of solar wind is coming from large convection patterns on the solar surface. It turns out that the switchbacks are associated with those, switch, those convection cells too. Our clue came as, as Parker Solar Probe made its sixth solar flyby, less than 25 solar radii out. Our data showed us that the switchbacks occur in discrete patches and that those patches have a higher percentage of helium ions relative to the other elements. And this enhanced helium effect is known to come from just above the solar photosphere. So this is now a direct connection from Parker Solar Probe down to the surface of the sun. Next slide. And it gets uh, even more interesting. The, the intervals of enhanced helium and the switchbacks appear to originate in, in concentrated regions of solar magnetic field that we call magnetic funnels. These funnels emerge from the photosphere between these large convection cells that you see in the video here. Um, and the cells are called supergranules. So think of like convection patterns in a pot of boiling water, but then add some magnetic field to it. Uh, pinpointing the origins and dynamics of these switchbacks is gonna help us uh, determine where the different solar wind streams come from, how the solar wind is heated. And this in turn can help us better predict space weather effects near earth. So with that, I'll pass the baton to, to Kelly and she can share the big ideas behind our new results and some milestones. 
Thank you, Stuart. Hello, my name is Kelly Cork, and I'm a program scientist at NASA headquarters on rotation from the Smithsonian. I am thrilled to be here today to discuss these Parker Solar Probe results as they have far reaching implications in our solar system and beyond. These are stellar phenomenon, not just solar phenomenon. Next slide, please. Parker Solar Probe's research impacts our understanding of the sun, the solar wind, the wind's interaction with other planets and space weather as part of NASA's Heliophysics System Observatory. This fleet of missions spans the solar system from the closest human-made object to the sun, Parker Solar Probe, to the farthest human-made object from Earth that are in interstellar space, Voyager 1 and 2. Together, these missions help us understand everything from the basic physics of our star, the sun, to how the solar wind accelerates and blows through the solar system, interacting with the Earth and other planets, our satellites in space, and technology right here on Earth. Parker also helps us under our understanding of other stellar systems. Learning about the sun's processes and characteristics help us understand their impacts on Earth, and they are key to understanding how other stars might pr provide life in other stellar systems. These, again, are stellar phenomena, not just solar phenomena. Next slide, please. Parker Solar Probe uses Venus to help slingshot itself closer to the sun. And those flybys also allow Parker to collect new measurements of Venus as it passes the planet. This year, Parker's Whisper instrument caught this photo of Venus. We've published a few papers on this in 2021, and we'll have some more exciting news to share in 2022. Next slide, please. So what's next for Parker? The first passage through the corona made and will continue to make new discoveries that other spacecraft were simply too far away to see. We were in the corona for only a few hours this time, but future passages will allow us longer durations in the solar atmosphere. When we crossed the corona, the spacecraft was roughly 800 degrees Celsius and moving at around 145 kilometers per second, or more than 328,000 miles per hour. As Parker Solar Probe continues to spiral closer to the sun, we're we will continue to break the record for the fastest and closest spacecraft to the sun. The spacecraft will eventually reach as close as 9.8 solar radii from the center of the sun in 2025. Our next closest approach of the sun is happening in January 2022 and will likely bring Parker Solar Probe through the corona again. As we head to the closest approach, we will also be heading into the peak of the sun's activity cycle, known as the solar cycle. We will be seeing more coronal mass ejections, flares, and energetic particles, all signatures of space weather. So it will be a really interesting time for Parker. The data to come will allow us a glimpse into the region that's critical for superheating the corona and pushing the solar wind to supersonic speeds. These types of instrument measurements from the corona will be critical for understanding and forecasting extreme space weather events that can disrupt telecommunications and damage satellites around the Earth. This is an exciting time to be a solar physicist. Next slide, please. Three years after Parker Solar Probe's launch and decades after the first mission concept, along with countless hours of a dedicated work by a large team, the results discussed here enable us to, for the first time, directly sample the region where the solar wind has its beginnings, as well as sampling the sun's atmosphere. The work that Justin described shows that we have crossed the Elfin critical surface, the wrinkly boundary between solar corona and solar wind, and now have a front row seat to see what is happening to superheat the corona. The work Stuart talked about reveals information about where the solar wind originates and gets pushed out from the sun, streaming throughout the solar system. Humanity has touched the sun, and revolutionary discoveries have just begun. Thank you. Thanks to our panelists, and we'll now move on to the question and answer part of our session. As a reminder, reporters, you can put your questions into the question and answer box. If you would like us to open your mic so you can ask it live, we can do that, or we will read your question for you. Our first question comes from Lisa Grossman at Science News. She asks, 
What did you know about the Alphen surface before Parker crossed it, and what new things are you learning now? Justin, why didn't you take that one? Thank you, Nikki. So we knew the Alphane surface had to exist because close to the sun, where we can measure its magnetic field, we know that these special waves, Alphane waves, uh, are so fast that they're much faster than, than any flows because the solar wind starts it at rest near the sun. But we know that Alphane speed decreases the further away you get from the sun. And we also know from Gene Parker's predictions, Gene Parker, who uh, first predicted the solar wind and who the mission is named after, that the solar wind goes faster as you get away from the sun. So we knew there had to be a point where the solar wind became super alphanic and therefore crossed through this critical point. We just didn't know where it was. Um, so most results either involve people looking at images of the sun, uh, corona, and trying to figure out, oh, do I still see waves going in both direction? All right, it must be higher than this, but I can't see um, where. And then we had spacecraft in the solar wind that would say, Yep, flowing faster than the Alphane speed. We get closer to the sun, like Noor said uh, on with solar probe, and, and that ratio would get smaller, but it's always been uh, super Alphanic. So this is the first time we're actually able to see it directly and figure out exactly where it is. Noor, did you want to follow up on that or are we done with that question? Uh I think, yeah, I think what Justin said is, is, is absolutely right. There is one thing that we, we have to watch for, and I think um, Sweep actually saw that, Sweep and Field saw that. We have the boundary that we know that we crossed and that we, we stayed within that boundary for several hours. But at times, we also have transients in the solar wind. These are parcels of the solar wind where the, um, within short time, the alpha speed will drop the solar wind speed will drop be below the um, the uh, alpha speed, but these are only transients. The, once they they they, they, they pass, uh, they fly past the spacecraft. We come back to the uh, sub, uh, super alphanic solar wind again. So these are two different uh, types of physics that we have we have to look for when we are looking at the, the data. All right. Our next question is coming from Ramin Skiba at Wired. How did you design the spacecraft to withstand the corona? Can it fly around the CME if one is emitted during a flyby? Yes, we put a lot of work and effort into designing a spacecraft. Um, in fact, uh, we're more worried about not seeing a coronal mass ejection and not flying through one than we are about flying through one. Um, the, the mission is designed to look at a full range of solar conditions. It launched around solar minimum um, when we do our final final configuration with that really, really super close approach that's going to be around solar maximum. And so we are completely designed to be able to withstand um, all of the, the things that the sun can throw at us. So we're excited about seeing a coronal mass ejection for sure. And a follow-up question from Lisa Grossman at Science News. How wavy or ragged is the Alphan critical surface? How do you know? What does that mean? And I'll just say we have a similar question from Alex Witsey at Nature for Justin or anyone on the panel. Can you describe the nature of the Alvin surface more? How sharp, complex, surprising was the actual boundary as the probe passed through it? Why don't we start with Justin and then Stuart maybe wants to um, add after Justin. Sure, yeah, I can, I can, let me give you a couple examples of what we know and what was surprising. Uh, so first, uh, there were a lot of questions about just how smooth the Alphane critical surface would be. So some thoughts were, it'll just be this like hash we're flying through. We won't even really know when we crossed it. So uh, what we report in the paper first was when we were flying under the Alphane critical surface each time, it was a pretty smooth transition. And while we were moving through it, uh, things overall changed pretty slowly. So it was, it was pretty well-defined. Um, on the other hand, we crossed through it three separate times during the encounter. The first and most dramatic time, uh, we were below for about five hours, and then we popped out the same uh, five hours later. Now, you might think five hours, that doesn't sound big, um, but solar probe is the fastest object humans have ever made. Uh, it's moving so quickly near the sun. In those uh, five hours, it actually moved about seven degrees over the surface of the sun. So it's, it's really tearing along at more than 100 uh, kilometers per second. Um, 
So then it popped back out again, and it's still getting closer to the sun. So that's interesting. And near its closest approach, it dove really deeply below the Alphane point. What I mean by that was the speed of the wind dropped to nearly half the speed of these waves. Very dramatic, but only for like half an hour. Uh, and then it popped back out again. And then on its way back out, it, it kind of skimmed below it for a couple hours. So what you can do is you can take the time those periods each lasted, you can see like just how much the speed dropped below that Alphane speed and what different distances we were at. And you can try to fit a line through all of that. And it, it has to be really wrinkly. So not necessarily fuzzy, like well-defined while we're under it, but the surface clearly has to have uh, some structure and warp to it. And that's, that's about all we know now is we have more encounters. And as we keep getting closer to the sun, we're gonna get a much better sense of um, how representative this was of the typical distance of the Alphane critical surface from the sun. Oh, from my point of view, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things here is that, um, as Justin pointed out, this uh, this first encounter we've had with the Alphane surface occurred over a, what's called a pseudo streamer. And, and you know, it's interesting that the, the furthest, the most distant crossing occurred over the pseudo streamer. So there's some, you know, some question as to whether that's important uh, for the location of the Alpine surface or not. And you should, you know, pseudo streamers are basically, you should think of them like, you know, it's like a confluence of two rivers, two magnetic rivers flowing out from the sun. Um, so I think that's one of the mysteries and one of the interesting things as well. Our next question comes from Jonathan Amos at BBC. Jonathan, we will invite you to open your mic now. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks very much uh, for doing this. Uh, can I just, I think, Noor, you, you showed the images looking out uh, the side from uh, uh, Parker. Uh, what exactly are we seeing there? What, what's making those lines? Are those protons? And um, what, I mean, what's the light? Is it uh, reflected light? Is it the emission from particles themselves? What, what actually are we, looking at when we see those lines going above and below. Hey, Noor, you're muted. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so this is the image I described earlier. And here it's a white light images. Basically, we are seeing light that is uh, scattered or reflected by electrons in the solar wind that is solar uh, light that is uh, scattered by, by photons through a process that we call Thomson scattering. And when you see bright structures, it means those regions are denser than, the, uh, the, the, than other, other regions of the solar corona. And what we are seeing here, if you follow the uh, top row of images, there is that bright structure. I'm, I'm, uh, if you see my cursor, I'm uh, pointing to it now. From left to right, you will see it moving up and up and up in the field of view. That is, the spacecraft is, it's basically, it's not, it's an apparent motion. It's not real motion in the solar, in the solar wind. It's just Parker Solar Probe is, is getting closer and closer to the structure, to the point that it's flying above the spacecraft. And the same thing happened for that um, other, other streamer what you, that is in the lower part. It is basically passing underneath the spacecraft because it's lower down in the, in the, um, in the corona. And I, as I mentioned before, this white light imaging, uh, what it tells us, it, it basically images the solar wind from when it is young, lower down in the solar corona, and it see it uh, accelerating all the way to Earth and, and beyond. The new thing we are learning here by flying through the solar corona, and you see it in these images as well, you see a lot of tiny structures here, everywhere. And that is the new uh, features that we are seeing for probably for the first time uh, when, we are, when we are getting very close to the source of the solar wind. And there is a lot of physics that we have to make sense of there, uh, analyzing this data and also the in-situ data from uh, sweeping fields. Right, right. So that, that light then is, is, is light that's been scattered by the electrons embedded in the magnetic fields. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. And in the yeah. movie, um, is that the same? Uh, it's, it's the same uh, it's the same except yeah. for the movies for yeah. the whole encounter at the spacecraft okay. uh, uh, swung by and uh, and i think if you pay attention to this movie you can actually see the spacecraft um, moving faster and faster when it is getting close to the yeah. sun and in the way out it's moving slower and slower but you see it in the cadence of the images but uh, yeah if, uh, it's it's an apparent thing but you can see it as well is is that the milky way passing uh, yeah absolutely the that's yeah. the milky way Yes. That's amazing. That is extraordinary. Yeah. Thank you.
Our next question is coming from freelance journalist Rich Balstein. Could you give the historical background for the Alpine line? When was it first theorized? No, do you I, want to take that one? Oh, yeah. Um, well, this this goes back to the work of uh, Johannes uh, Alvein. Uh, this is named after the Swedish physicist Hannes Alvein. He's um, a theoretician, and he did a lot of great work on MHD, magnetic uh, hydrodynamic physics of plasmas. And in the late 30s, early 40s, he theorized, yeah, there is a new type of waves in, in magnetized plasmas that he called them uh, alpha waves. And these are basically how the information is communicated within uh, between magnetized plasma from a place to another. These are ripples in the magnetic fields that are moving at this speed. And this the speed of at which these um, uh, waves are propagating, they depend on the magnetic field and they depend also on the characteristic of the plasma, the, the, the density in particular. So uh, when you are moving in a magnetic uh, plasma, um, the plasma of the um, the speed of the plasma itself, when you compare it to the alpha in speed, sometimes it's below and that's subalvenic, and sometimes it's above and that, that's superalvenic, and that's actually what what where the all this theory comes from about the alpha uh, alpha alpha waves and uh, alpha uh, solar wind. Um, by the way, um, Johannes Alvin actually uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize for the discovery of these waves. And it's a fundamental properties of magnetized plasmas. The next question is coming from Monica Young, Sky and Telescope. Has passing through the Alphine surface helped you to rule out any scenarios for what's producing the switchbacks? Stuart, why don't you go for that one? Oh boy, um, not yet, I would say. I mean, so, so we expect that the amplitude of the switchbacks, the, their, their magnitude, how far they switch back um, should decrease as we get closer to the sun. And we have been seeing that actually, we have been seeing a decrease, but I think we don't have enough data yet below the alphane point to, to definitely pinpoint, uh, to pinpoint the relationship between the, you know, the magnetized corona and the, and the amplitude and the existence of the switchbacks. We'll get there. All right, next question from Eileen Woodward, Wall Street Journal. During the April 28th pass, how far were you in terms of millions of miles from the center of the sun? How much closer was this than any other previous flyby? Do you anticipate that other stars similar to the sun will have similar alpha and critical surface? Sure. Uh, so we were um, about, let me think, 5.8 million miles um, above the sun's surface for this one. Um, and uh, is that right? Or is no, 6.3 6 for this one. No, you were no, eight no. and a half million I, when we flew yeah, through the surface. Half, thank you. Eight and a half when we actually flew through, yes. Um, one of the things that was surprising, I think, is that certainly compared to when we first were designing the mission, we thought we'd have to go a lot closer to actually see the Alphane surface. That's actually one of the reasons that um, Parker plunges to within 10 solar radii um, for that final orbit. And that was really to absolutely guarantee that we would see the Alphane surface. Modeling that was done during the actual development of the, the mission and new results actually predicted it would be seen, seen further out. And so uh, we, we're very happy to see it when we saw it because as Stuart notes, um, the, the upcoming continual closer and closer approaches will give us a lot more data underneath the Alphane surface to really pinpoint um, not just the, the um, origin of the switchbacks, but also many other um, science that we haven't even discovered yet because we've only had a few hours under there. So I'm um, very happy to see it. Um, anyone else jump in if you want to add to that? You're muted, no? One of the fascinating things that we are learning from this few hours that we are below the, uh, the, uh, the critical boundary, and also even before, is now we can connect what we measure in situ in the solar wind to what is going on at the base of the solar corona. And that is something that is extremely hard because uh, um, in magnetized plasma, everything is fluctuating and everything is changing. But seeing where the solar wind is coming from, as Stuart described it earlier, that is fascinating. And getting more of that data will tell us exactly how the solar wind is born in the first place and what gets it uh, accelerated and heated. And uh, that is the big question that we are pondering for.
for many, many decades now. And to address the, the um, other stars, yes, other stars have winds and other stars have coronas. So we do expect that there would be alphane surfaces um, or critical surfaces there as well. So again, as we learn about our star, we're going to be able to apply them to, to other astrophysical problems as well. And a follow-up from Alan. So did you not expect to see the alphan critical surface during the April flyby, given you thought you had to go closer? I'm gonna let Justin take that one because he perked up, so. Well, okay, so I'm always called an optimist. I'll acknowledge that. But um, a few years ago, uh, Chris Klein and I uh, published a paper where we were speculating that um, unusual things we were seeing and how the solar was being heated kind of suggested that the alphane point was uh, associated with these um, high temperatures and that we might be able to measure where the alphane point was just by looking at measurements of the solar wind really far from the sun. So we, we made a little crude model and we kind of took every measurement and said, all right, based on these trends, where's the alphane point? And looking at 20 plus years of data from NASA's wind spacecraft, it looked like the alphane point was moving like this every 11 years as solar activity changed more solar activity, further out the alphane point goes. So we plotted this breathing of the alphane surface and Parker Solar Probe's orbit where we're getting closer and closer. And it looked like late 2020, early 2021, we were going to pass through that surface if that model was correct. So we were really hopeful when, when that data came down that we'd see it, but you know, the last couple orbits before that, we were also uh, thinking it was gonna happen. So I'll, I'll take predicting it within uh, a year and you know it's just the first crossing right I, I think it'll be more encounters before we're spending you know half of our time below the alphane critical surface and we have a question from apologies marcia dunn at the associated press she says so the toe tipping into the corona happened in april eight months ago how long did it take to confirm this boundary had been crossed she's wondering why it took eight months to announce this and if April was the only crossing of the boundary, when will the next crossing be? Will it happen in January? Go ahead, Justin. Okay, um, I'll, I'll try not to get too much into the spacecraft challenges and maybe Nor can talk to that. Uh, I'll, I'll just say one of the issues uh, from the spacecraft is you have to wait before you can get the data down. Um, so, but Nor, Nor can talk more about uh, those challenges and, and how that drives us crazy. Uh, but we finally got the data down a couple months later, and we started looking at it. And um, one of the issues is, you know, the, the spacecraft is moving through such a great range in distances. And, you know, at closest approach, the front is being hit by like five megawatts of sunlight. Um, you know, temperatures are, are, are amazing. Our instruments get up to maybe worst case 1500 degrees Celsius. So you want to be really careful that you don't publish a paper based on you know, the instrument got warmer and led you to believe, right? So fortunately, Solar Probe has very complementary instruments. So we have multiple instruments and in sweep that can measure directly how fast uh, ions and electrons are moving around. So we got measurements of the solar wind speed from there and density. And we were like, wait a minute, like this, this looks close. Maybe this is right. But then the electric fields uh, antennas that this on Stuart Bale's fields investigation they can actually measure the density um, by looking at vibrations in the plasma and measuring the frequency of them. And it's a very precise measurement of the density. So we took those measurements, we compared them with our density measurements. We got things to line up. We're like, ah, okay, we've got multiple measurements of the speed, multiple measurements of the density. That took several months to convince ourselves uh, that it all checked out right. And it's, it's uh, really a tribute to the the way the instruments complement each other, uh, that we were able to do that and, and have this confidence in announcing it. I'll just mention another issue, which was just, um, it, it took us a few months to realize one thing we're reporting here is we were subalphanic. We were below the alphane speed. That's something we've been waiting for for, for years, right? We, we've talked about that a lot. But a second thing happened that we weren't expecting, which was the pressure exerted by the magnetic field was also a lot greater than the pressure from the particles, like 10 to 100 times greater. So when you're below the alphane critical surface, 
the energy of the solar wind, the particles, is less than the energy uh, of the magnetic field, but the pressure is completely controlled. Uh, and that was um, really surprising. And it took us, uh, kind of made us reset writing this up when we were like, oh, wow, this is a lot more significant than we thought. And then finally, realizing that it connected to a pseudo streamer and, and running those models to figure that out, we wanted to make sure we got that right. Because showing we're making these connections, that's the whole point of the mission. Uh, we just didn't think it would be so clear the first time it happened uh, that we were seeing flows from a particular structure on the sun. And Nora, I don't know if you want to talk about some of the, the data download challenges we face. You're muted. You're muted, Nora. Mute myself every time. So as Justin was just saying, Crossing the Alpha and Critical Point is so, it's a major achievement for the mission. That's that's something we have been looking for for World to for a long, long, long time. And we just want to make sure that we are right. We have to check, recheck, and do everything and make sure if we, what we are publishing is correct and we are indeed uh, below the uh, Alpha and Critical Point. So uh, the other thing that Justin mentioned, that why the delay, um, there are, we cannot bring the uh, science data from uh, the spacecraft uh, at will. So it depends a lot on the geometry between uh, the spacecraft and Earth. Uh, if we are well aligned, we can downlink our data, but sometimes that, that does not happen all the time during the orbit. So we have to wait for these periods of times when we have the right geometry that the we can point the um, uh, the high gain antenna to Earth and just start bringing down the data. So that's that's another thing with the deep space missions, and and we have to we have just to live with it. But let me let me say one thing. Parker sort of probe is returning five to ten times more data than we plan pre-launch and that is a testimony how the system is working so well that we're exploiting it to the to the maximum we can by bringing as much data as we, as we can and this is one of the uh, one of the big discoveries as, as a result of that data we are bringing down I think there is there is a follow up question saying when will be the next time that we will cross the uh, alpha and critical point. I, the expectation now that um, as we fly uh, closer and closer to the sun is that we will keep flying below the uh, this critical boundary uh, when we are closer to the sun. But there is another factor also that we have to keep in mind. Uh, as solar activity uh, rises, the alpha and critical point will be breathing in and out uh, uh, um, from, from the sun. And sometimes we'll see it closer to the sun, sometimes we'll see it a little bit further out. And that's actually one of the things what, what that we are looking for, for too, because there is, that's a new physics, that's physics we are going to learn about this environment that we are flying through for the, for the first time. And Stuart, do you want to comment on um... Is April the only time we've flown, flown through this? I think there, I, I would say that we probably crossed it again on Encounter 9, which was in August uh, of this year. It's not, it hasn't been fine tuned like Justin described. We haven't gone through the, you know, the data quality to, to, to be as sure as we are on the, on the one that's been published. But, but it, uh, first look at it, it looks like we crossed it for a, a short time. Great. We've reached the end of our question queue. Are there any, wait, one more. I see another question popping up. From Lisa Grossman at Science News. Sounds like they're sure about April. Do you suspect about August to confirm? I wouldn't say suspect, I'd say it's preliminary. Any further questions from our reporters in the audience? Well, I'd like to thank our panelists for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for the many good questions today. Uh, we will have contact information and information on where you can get those videos, those slides, and um, watch a recording of this if you want to revisit. And I'll turn it over to Becca for final comments. Yeah, thanks, Liza. I just want to thank you again the panelists and the reporters who joined us um, and point out that our next uh, press event today is a press briefing on the challenges and advances in carbon dioxide removal. And that will take place at 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, thank you for joining us and hope to see you later today. <laughs>